Okay, and welcome to the fourth episode of the form, now known as Formidable Podcast. I'm Matt Northwood, and today I am joined on the podcast by um, a very special guest, um, Mr. Mark Dawes. Um, what I'd like to do is ask Mark to introduce himself, what he does, and, and then we'll go from there, if possible. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Matt. Um, as Matt said, my name is Mark Dawes. I'm a director of a company called NFPS Limited. We specialise in all aspects of use and force training from physical restraint through to self-defence, handcuffing, conflict resolution. We also do other communication skills such as NLP, hypnotherapy uh, and, and those sorts of things as well to sort of broaden our, our ability to reach as many people and help as many people as possible. So that's fundamentally sort of in a nutshell what we do. Okay, brilliant. Um, so obviously the topics that I, I, I tend to relate to within this podcast are going to be stuff around self-defense, personal safety, all those sort of, sort of bits and pieces. Um, I suppose the first question for you is, um, what do you, where did you start learning this? How, how in terms of personal safety, where, where did you um, take this from in the beginning, I suppose? Well, I, I was running martial arts classes in West London, uh, jiu-jitsu clubs to be specific. And a, a lady approached me, she'd been sat there watching the class one evening and she approached me and she said, look, um, my son needs to learn this. He needs to do some sort of self-defense training. He's been badly bullied at school. He's got no self-confidence, no self-esteem. He needs to come to the class, but because of the issues, lack of self-confidence, self-esteem, he's not likely to come. So she asked me, could I teach her something that she could go back and teach to her son? So I said, yeah, absolutely, no, no problem at all. And what was interesting about that was there was a couple of other black belts with me at the club at the time, and they said, no, 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 she needs to be a black belt for, black belt before she can teach self-defense. And I, I questioned that, and I said, well, what, why? Why does she need to be a black belt to teach self-defense? She needs to be a black belt to teach jiu-jitsu, which is what we were doing, but surely she doesn't need, need it to teach self-defense. And they said, yeah, she does. And that, that really got me thinking. That, that was part of the catalyst to look into this and find out, you know, why were these myths and misconceptions out there? So that woman approaching me fundamentally was the, the start of it. And then I was approached by the police in West London uh, as part of a crime prevention initiative and they said would I teach the physical stuff and they would teach the the actual legal side and the personal safety side and I thought yeah great this is a brilliant opportunity for me to learn so I ran courses with the police they did all the chalk and talk stuff and I did all the physical stuff and that opened up avenues for us to talk to large pharmaceutical companies and other large companies out there that had staff who were taking uh, briefcases full of drugs basically around very um sort of risky areas and they were asking us for advice on, on what they could and couldn't do so that was fundamentally the catalyst that got me sort of springboarded into the industry oh brilliant okay do you think um it's evolved much over the years this the self-defense industry as such um it has and it hasn't i mean if, if you think about you know technology now i mean you, you can buy an alarm which emits a spray uh, which will also give you a high pitched sound it will also if you program it you know tell a number of your your program colleagues where you are so, so it will send them a map to their, their iphone or their mobile phone to say I'm, I'm here and i'm unsafe so in terms of equipment yeah technology's come a long way you know than what we had when we started off with but it doesn't replace the the fundamental human human qualities of being aware you know, people need to, to understand their situation. They need, they need to have situational awareness. They need to have their personal safety awareness about them. Um, and if you don't get those fundamentals right, all the technology in the world is not going to help you. I mean, to give you an example, my, my wife's email went down over the weekend for no reason whatsoever. It just went down. We couldn't get hold of anyone at Microsoft. So we had three days without an email and things were backing up. So we, we tend to become too reliant sometimes on technology. Um, and I think it was General George Schwarzkopf in the first Gulf War, um, they were talking about the use of special forces soldiers in the first Gulf. And he said, no, 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 we don't need them. We've got technology now. We've got these drones and all these this phenomenal stuff and you know, these aircraft that can see over the horizon. We don't need special forces soldiers. And he was proved wrong, you know, because there's nothing better than a Mark I eyeball, you know, on the ground looking at the target. And I believe, as the story went, that he actually was invited to Hereford after the war, and he went back there and apologised for the misassumption that he made. You know, yeah. so I think the basics uh, are, are always be the same. And 
people want to teach advanced stuff these days. We have advanced courses on this and advanced courses on that. But as a good friend of mine, John Stedman, always said, you know, advanced stuff is only the basics done better. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're going back to the point about sort of um, the special forces type of thing. That that's that's. I mean, you know, you just have to look at the, the sort of Bravo Two Zero story to go that they had all the technology, and that still sort of went went wrong to to a, to a degree. Um, you know, and what's the old adage? The best laid plans don't survive contact with the enemy sometimes. And I think that you know that, that's that's one of the big things there, isn't it? But, um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that you know the fundamentals and stuff are. You, you made quite a good, no, a very, very good point on on the fact of people wanting to do all the glitzy, glamorous stuff, and and it does come back to sort of the, the, the fundamentals and the basics of of things. Um, which lead me sort of um, on to sort of how do you, uh, what sort of the common things do you think people do struggle with 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 self defence? I mean, we just talked about it then, but like obviously. You've got all that information coming into you from different sources and different angles, and, and you know the the advanced stuffs being sort of sold, um, you know uh, the, the Gucci type, you know techniques and stuff like that. What do you think are the the, the, the problems for people um, that, that people do struggle with most of all? I think self belief and self confidence is the biggest problem. You know, people see, you know, or they know what they want to do. But because of the situation, because of the experiences they've been exposed to, it could even be experiences of bad training. We've had them on our training courses. You know, people have come along that have literally been bullied by instructors on, on certain courses and their, their self-esteem and their self-worth is, is at an all-time low. So I think self-belief is, is one of the things that a lot of people struggle with. And they're the, they're the people who really need self-defense training because a lot of people that go on the courses, fundamentally, in my opinion, don't need it. You know, they're, they're, they're already confident. They're confident enough to go. They already have, you know, a good gait when they're walking. They have a good presence about themselves. They don't have that victim mentality and don't present themselves as the victim when they're out. But the ones that really need it are the ones that, that think they can't do it. And I, I think they should be encouraged. You know, it goes back to, to how we started with the mum coming and asking me if I could teach her something so she could teach her son. And, you know, this gets compounded sometimes. I mean, I, I had someone on the phone to me only last week and, and they were talking about a self-defense course that they observed and they do a lot of community work and they they didn't got the self-defense course together for people and invited these instructors along and this person told me that they had people doing rolling break falls and you know slamming themselves on the floor and you know one of the fundamental things that ginger johnson for example who's brilliant at teaching all this stuff you know one of his fundamental rules is you don't go to ground you know yeah. if, if you go to ground it's so hard to fight so why are we encouraging people to do things that really aren't functional in terms of a, of a self-defense situation because and I, I think it's from the martial arts element which again goes back to another myth you know about, about you can't do self-defense until you've done martial arts we, we get asked that all the time you know people want to book on our courses and they say well i haven't done any martial arts i don't have a black belt so you don't need one no. you know martial arts is about form over function you know martial arts now in this country is governed by as a sporting governing body so if you look at a lot of, of the movements, it's all about the form. It's about having your feet in the correct position, standing in the right way, delivering the blow the right way. Um, and that's great because you need to develop that form for that particular art so you can progress through the art. But self-defense is about function over form. It's got to work, you know, and it doesn't matter how, how rough it looks. At the end of the day, if it creates a window of opportunity for someone to escape, that's a good self-defense move. So it doesn't have to be you know, precise in terms of its form. Absolutely, I think um, yeah, I think you, you, you're totally right. That it's it, it's it's in a lot recently from my own point of view of, of people who are you know sort of in in that martial arts you know them the, being the differences there and and and, and you know it's 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 as you say it is what it is. Um, would you say that it you know looking at looking at the curriculums of schools and stuff? Do you think that that's an area that that it should be sort of taught in sort of self defence? Is is that something that's um, that's needed? Do you think? I think it wouldn't be a bad thing to include it in a curriculum. Um, why not? You know, we we've only got to turn the news on when, and we're hearing about young people getting stabbed and dying. You know, uh, women being attacked now. It's 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 more common in there. So. Yeah, why not teach kids stuff? But I, I think there needs to be a balanced approach to this because if we sell them the fear story that you need self-defense because the world's a bad place, then we feed into the, the fear, you know, and they, they leave school worrying about going everywhere. 
So if if I had my agenda, if they gave if they gave me the job for Minister of Education and said do what you like, uh, I would I would I would bring self defence into schools. No two ways about that. But I'd balance it by teaching them things like mindfulness and meditation, um, because that's brilliant for resilience training. You know that that builds their confidence and their self esteem and gives them good resilience. So when they take a knock, you know I mean I'm talking about in life in general, you know they can bounce back from that. But also I'd teach them entrepreneurship. Yeah, you know, if you look at if you look at the school system now, uh, they say, right, you know, work hard, get get all your exams, leave school, get a job. The reality is, these young people now they're working hard, they're getting their exams, they're leaving school, and they can't get a job. And I know from working with some schools that the people who are leaving school are going back and telling the younger people who are still at school, no point working hard to get your exams, you're not going to get a job. Yeah. So if if we look at the culture of schools and, and what schools are there to do, which is to educate our young people, to, to make them a functional member of society, I think the process has to change, you know, because more and more now we're seeing people they're not in jobs for life they're going from one job to another you know they'll make it made redundant have to find another job so that's why the resilience part is so important and we need to teach them that it, it's okay you know to to not have a job for the rest of your life i mean when i when i left school i i joined the royal navy i could have stayed in the royal navy all of my life you know i i got give even before i joined the royal navy I, I had an apprenticeship and i could have stayed in that company for most of my life that's what people did completely different world now and, and so we we need to give these these young people the skills to be able to function in a world that wasn't there when the education system was devised decades ago so yeah you know um the long-winded answer is absolutely it should be taught in schools it improves self-confidence improves self-esteem but it needs to be balanced with other other um functional skills as well i think the um i think i've read somewhere about the 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 education system and exactly what you've just said which is around um you know, it was built 100 years ago for, for a work, you know, the, the education system was built to build a workforce rather than to actually build anything, you know, like you say about entrepreneurship and, and other bits like that, you know, people being in jobs for, for a lifetime. And, and, you know, my old industry is a prime example of it, you know, that, that there was a, you know, being in the police and stuff is, was, was seen at one point as being, you know, I've got lots of friends who, who've been in for, for 30 odd years and then they have a 30 year career. But I think that that's evolving now. I mean, I'm, I'm probably a prime example of it that, you know, I, I didn't do, I'm not going to stand here and say I've done 10, 15 years in the job because I haven't. But my, my passion for sort of personal safety and self-defence meant that, you know, I wanted to do something else outside of the force. And and, and that was the bigger pull than, than staying in. So, and I think there's a lot of that um, out there. And say people will do sort of shorter career spans and then move on to other things, I think as we go through yeah yeah and I, I don't think that's a bad thing you know um because it allows people to develop i mean my, my dad only ever gave me one piece of advice when i left school uh, you know i was going to join the royal navy and he said he said the minute you stop enjoying it don't do it do something else and i'd signed for 22 years in the navy i absolutely loved it um i then got commissioned became an officer and things didn't work out for me and i stopped enjoying it and it was a very simple decision you know i could either go back and do a role I didn't want to do anymore, or I resign my commission and come outside. So I resigned my commission and came outside. I won't say it was easy. It was very, very hard, um, but it's allowed me to develop and do other things that some of my colleagues who, who stayed in the services for their full career haven't been able to do. No, okay. With that in mind then, how do you think that you would define success then with, with, with that in mind? A success? Oh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a great quote of success. It comes from a guy called Earl Nightingale. And he says that success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Uh, and what that means is, is if you're doing something that you love, you're successful. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a teacher because you want to be a teacher or you're a carer because you want to be a carer or a police officer because you want to be a police officer, that's, that's success if that's what you want to do because you're making a difference to the world on your terms. You're enjoying what you do. You know, I mean, I, I've been doing this now for almost 30 years and, you know, I've worked with very successful people. You know, I, I know a couple of guys are multi, multi-millionaires and the guys I know are really good guys, but I know some very rich people who, who are not happy. You know, they're rich in monetary terms, but they've got failed relationships. You know, they never spend time with their children, never spend time with their partner. They're consistently, it's like an addiction. They're looking for the, the next thing to sell or, the, you know, the, the next amount of money to make. And, you know, you could say, yeah, okay, you're, you're financially rich, but you're not successful. 
you know, so I, I'll go back to that definition time and time again, you know, success is the progressive realization of any worthy ideal, anything you're working towards that you love doing that, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, something that you're going to dedicate probably the rest of your life to because you want to, that's success. Yeah, nice. I think I, I think you're you're quite into him as well. You you quite like Stephen Bartlett, don't you? Um, uh, the, the guy from Dragons Den, the new guy from Dragons Den. I think he put a couple of quotes from his recently, um, or sort of bits from him recently. And I saw him put something on his podcast about um, saying about success and about sort of people. You know, I think he he obviously comes from a, I think he comes from like a council estate or something in. in like I don't know where, where it was now, maybe maybe Portsmouth or somewhere down south. And um, he was saying that once you get like to a certain, the, the numbers in your bank, you know, saying what, what exactly what you said, like the numbers in your bank account don't correlate to happiness. They they you know having a forty foot, a fifty foot, or a sixty foot yacht doesn't make a lot of difference, you know, in, in what you've got. But when you go in, when you're taking somebody from you know who's on. 20 grand a year up to like 100 grand 100 grand a year that's a big significant step in life that is and that's that's going to make a lot of difference to to their to their lifestyle and, and happiness but it's not you know it, it's still not money isn't the, the be all and end all of things i don't think and i think that's what he was trying to sort of well that's how i saw it with him saying to be honest yeah but I, I commented on one of his videos that was a, that was on linkedin i think and it, yeah. you know he, he was talking about young people wanting the next rolex or wanting the next you know uh, lamborghini and, you know, I, I look at people like Warren Buffett, who's one of the richest investors in the world. He drives around in a clapped out old car, you know. Yeah. He, he knows a car's not an asset. You know, you buy a car, it depreciates, you lose money. You know, so, uh, you, you know, it's people, I think we're, we've got this Instagram and, and what do they call the influencers and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, how much money have these people actually got, you know, in, yeah. in terms of what they've got? Or, or have, they, have they bought it and are they in debt up to their ears? I don't, I don't know. You know, I wouldn't wish them ill. But it gives a false sense of reality, yeah. you know, and, and then people want to strive to be like that. So their, their lives become a bit self-centered, you know, because uh, it has to be. If you, if, you, if, you, if you want to live that life that way, if it's just for the money, you're going to become self-centered. And that creates alienation. It creates separateness, you know, and as human beings, we're, we're, we're designed to function in societies. You know, the whole basis of evolution is cooperation. You only got to look at nature as a symbiotic relationship. You start alienating and separating people from one another uh, and then you, you're going to get stress you're going to get illness you're going to get disease you know i think it was bruce lipton a uh, famous cellular biologist who said that 95 percent now of all illnesses we see in our, in our world are created by the environments that we create to live in so a human being is a unique animal you know we create our environments we build our cities we build the houses we build the towns and villages uh, so we create our environment every other animal adapts to their environment we create our environment and then we can't function in it. You know, the environment causes this uh, stress. And we, the Western world is one of the highest rates of chronic diseases, you know, throughout the whole planet. So yeah. you have to look at this and say, well, what are we trying to do with all this stuff? You know, because I think it was Denzel Washington. I was listening to, to one of his videos. And it was either him or Morgan Freeman, one of the two. They're both brilliant guys. And they said, you'll never see a U-Haul following a hearse. And, you know, the American U-Haul thing is where you, you yeah. put all your possessions in and when you move house, they, they said, you know, it's the, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse and you don't. There's no pockets in shrouds. So yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have an issue with people that want to be successful and, and want the financial security. I get that. Yeah. You know, but how much money do you need? Yeah, no, fair enough. It does make, yeah, it makes, makes perfect sense. I think, say, going back into sort of like the personal safety in that, um, what do you what would you be your number one sort of takeaway in terms of helping people with their personal safety and, and sort of self believe simple for me believe in yourself yeah you know if you believe in yourself everything's achievable you know everything everything's possible it, so and I mean, going back to one of the things you said what do people struggle with it's it's lack of self belief so if they can start believing in themselves and, and if we think about ourselves as human beings for a moment you know we we are phenomenal phenomenal things you know, we're a composite of, of, you know, 50 to 60 trillion cells in our body. Each cell does six tr trillion things per second. You know, you can't get computers to do this stuff. Yeah. We have 400 billion neurons inside our brain, you know, and we're only using two or three percent of them. You know, in, in, and I heard recently, I don't know if it's true or not, someone can Google it and tell me, but we have the same amount of neurons in our brain as stars and planets in the Milky Way galaxy. 
well, that wasn't given to us by accident. That wasn't there just to design so you, you can sit at a desk and push a pen and a piece of paper all day long. Everything that, that a human being has achieved in life, everything that's been created has been created because we have the ability to think, you know, and that's what separates us from, from our animal species. You know, we can think and we can create. And so when people say, I, I can't do that, you know, uh, or, you know, I don't, I don't have a self-confidence or I don't believe in myself, that narrative is so damaging when you consider that it's human beings that put other human beings on the moon. You know, when we work together and collaborate, that that's that's achievable. Smart, isn't it? It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Where could anybody, if anybody wanted to find any information about you, yourself or what you do, where could where could they find that? Where could they go to and, and sort of get that information from? Well, they can go straight to the website, which is uh, www.nfps.info, and all the information in our blog posts and everything, and all our courses are up there. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming on today, Mark. I've, yeah, you, you've been a brilliant guest and, and it's, it's been really informative. And um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. You're welcome, Matthew. Thanks yeah, for having bye -bye. me. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Cheers.